So we're joined by Dr. Gordon Gallia, who's a director of the Division of Non-Communicable Diseases at the WHO. Uh, Gordon, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to the NJ this afternoon. It's a pleasure, Duncan. Thank you. Now, um, this report comes out every four years uh, and it looks at a range of things, um, health behaviour in children, obviously, but that includes cyberbullying and uh, children's relationships with their parents and things like that. So what's the WHO's interest in these kind of quite soft um, health behaviours? What, what's the WHO uh, doing here? It, the best way of summarizing it is, is we have developed what we call the Health 2020 policy that is adopted by all the 53 member states um, of Europe and it defines what, where we want to go in the next few years uh, after it was adopted in 2012 until 2020 in reducing inequity, increasing participatory governance, addressing the social determinants of health. And uh, it is a combination of uh, efforts to address specific diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, infections, um, as well as to uh, look at the broader contexts, um, living conditions and the way people uh, develop uh, throughout the life course. Um, many people call child, uh, adolescence uh, as the second chance. Uh, indeed, WHO recently produced a book called Second Decade, Second Chance. We don't have a choice which parents we get, what genes we are landed with, what house uh, we are uh, living in as a baby, whether we are breastfed or not, uh, what school we are sent to or not. Uh, so all of these are sort of take set the context for the first decade of life and then the second decade beginning ages 11 through 15 when uh, which are the target of this survey uh, people start to develop their own autonomy they start to take decisions and if they have been somehow impaired in their early uh, first years of life they start to get maybe if society gives them this the chance to repair some of the damage and to propel themselves into better things in adulthood. What delineates the edge of the report as it were? Because I know at the journal we find this difficult ourselves that so much leads into health behaviours and and public health and things like that that we have to kind to try and and you know set a, a a boundary within which we operate so what sets the that boundary for the um, HBC report? The choice of areas um, to cover are uh, to be as comprehensive as possible across the social determinants of health um, and the behavioural determinants of health uh, as they affect adolescents. Um, it tries to be both positive and negative, looking at both the risk factors and the protective factors. Each of the questions is as evidence-based as possible. We would like to be in a, question, in, in a situation where if we're asking about breakfast, we know that the question we're asking is related to a healthful behaviour that uh, therefore we are seeking um, the, the level at which adolescents report it in order to be able to provide the countries with an index against which they could run uh, their own interventions. And finally, we add uh, questions about social determinants such as family affluence uh, in order to be able to look at the social gradients within society. Do you concentrate on modifiable factors or, or are you just trying to get a baseline for a lot of this? Um, I think it is fair to say that either we're looking at factors that are modifiable or factors that are can identify young people at risk or families in special need or pockets of population that are uh, in special need. So uh, the, as much as possible, this is not a research instrument, um, but it is a, a, a broad surveillance instrument that can feed into uh, more specific intervention design. Mm. Um, and the, the exact questions that you ask change every year. You add in uh, different things. How involved are children themselves in setting the agenda for this? 
young people are not involved in the core questions. Um, so there are a number of, of standard questions that have stood the test of time, kept as comparable as possible between one iteration and the other um, of the survey uh, uh, in order to try and keep the comparability between countries and over time and to be able to get the type of trends that we show in the report. Having said that, uh, the core questions are not the only component uh, within the, uh, the, the instrument, the health behavior of school-aged children. There are other uh, questions that are done at other sessions, not just at the, at the classroom uh, session where uh, the, the core question is filled up, but other optional packages give us a broader picture uh, of, uh, of the child and the adolescent experience. The selection of these optional packages has young people involved. And indeed, most countries, if not all, who participate give young people the chance to participate even in the interpretation of the, of the results and in selecting the policy interventions that are then um, uh, recommended to the government. So let's um, talk about the actual findings of this report then. Um, it first started back in 1983-84 uh, with some countries and now it's expanded and carried on every four years. Indeed, there were five countries to begin with and in this last iteration we have 42. So it's been uh, a very nice growth and given that we have 53 member states in the region, um, that is well over, well, four-fifths of the, of the region is now uh, represented. Over that time, we've seen a big change in um, incomes and, and socioeconomic factors that, that obviously we know affect um, health behaviour. So can you take us through any sort of top line trends that, that you've noticed? Picking a few, um, uh, we've been very pleasantly uh, impressed, uh, but, uh, just to start with some good news, um, uh, it's so easy to be uh, morose uh, about uh, yeah all the all the trends that you see in young people, one uh, 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 or society as it goes, and as one grows older, one gets more pessimistic. Uh, indeed, there are that there are many uh, positive uh, trends. Uh, one of the ones that are close to my heart uh, is the fact that uh, tobacco is definitely uh, on the decline. Um, uh, there's this image of the of the teenage girls uh, puffing away outside the mall or the supermarket, um, and uh, and and the beginning to to acquire the the behaviors that will lead them to uh, ill health uh, later in the future. Indeed, uh, smoking does appear uh, to be on the decline. Uh, this mirrors an overall decline uh, that we are seeing in, uh, uh, across, uh, across Europe. Indeed, uh, minor increases among uh, girls, but the, but, the, uh, but the overall trend is, is in, a, in, in a heartening direction and does imply that, these, uh, that the, the strong measures being taken by many European member states in order to uh, address tobacco are even reaching uh, down into this uh, adolescent uh, mm. age group. And are we seeing the same thing across all the socioeconomic gradients as well? Generally, many of the patterns that we are seeing are uh, either uh, the benefits are lesser in the, in the, in the poorer families um, and the harms are greater. Uh, so there we, we generally see uh, social gradients in, uh, in almost every behavior that we are looking at or reporting on. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the improvement is happening across the whole, uh, across the whole spectrum, but it is more, uh, it, it is more in, uh, in richer uh, families. While alcohol, for example, is also declining somewhat, um, it, it is more a decline in, uh, in alcohol consumption in uh, adolescent boys um, uh, being mirrored by an increase in adolescent girls. 
So what we are seeing is a convergence, a uh, lessening of the gap between boys and girls, um, but at the same time we are uh, not too happy uh, th that, th that this does mean that, that girls are, are putting themselves at greater risk. And indeed, in possibly part of the darker picture that comes out, out of this report are so many indicators that are getting worse uh, for girls. They, have, they, uh, they are tend to be thinner, um, but they have, are more conscious about their appearance. They are uh, more likely to think of themselves as being fat, to do things like uh, dieting and go into extreme behaviors um, to try and make themselves uh, thinner. Uh, so there are, m they are more likely to report themselves uh, as being unwell or that their health is in fair or poor conditions. They're more likely um, to have subjective indicators of mental ill health, um, for example, by indicating that they have uh, many episodes uh, of feeling poorly every week. So among girls, um, there is a, th this report paints a picture of more needing to be done in order to both support and protect their, their mental as well as their physical health. Mm. So the two things that you mentioned there, smoking and, and a preoccupation with your weight perhaps, are very societal mediated um, behaviours as opposed to maybe economic ones that that people have, would have worried about before. So is there, is there this shift, do you think? It's, uh, it's interesting for us. Uh, we would read the report to see, is there any sign of rumbles due to the financial crisis and that sort of thing. And uh, I have to admit that within this instrument, if you look at the broad range of questions, um, you do not see major differences between this uh, uh, report and the one that reflects the survey of four years ago, which would have reflected a time before the financial crisis. Um, so it is more an issue of whether the family is coping financially um, uh, uh, that then reflects on the, on the children in that family, as opposed to seeing within these surveys some major um, upheaval uh, on a European level. Sure. Now something obviously we're worried about uh, in the UK and across Europe and across the world is uh, the widening gap between the, the most socio-economically advantaged and disadvantaged. Yes, we, we are seeing Definitely a gap, um, uh, the, uh, th and indeed have uh, have report have titled um, this uh, this report "Growing Up Unequal," um, because there is a there's quite a bit of a difference between uh, boys and girls and rich and old, uh, well, well uh, rich and poor, um, and there is generally some difference uh, as the adolescence uh, increase. Um, the, uh, the differences between this report and the previous one do not strike you as dramatically that somehow uh, one hears in the media the 1% and the 99% and that sort of thing. It is possibly an issue of the sensitivity of the instrument and the representativeness of the sample where we can see the gradients but again do not have uh, major uh, differences in, in inequality to report between the, the, this report and the previous one. Okay. Um, this brings me on to my last question, which is, um, you've said some of these factors are, you know, economic, some are very societal, um, some are modifiable, some might not be. So what's WHO doing to try and address some of the perhaps regressive trends that we've seen um, what levers do you have and what levers do even governments have to do this? So when, um, one of the ways to do this is to actually produce reports like this um, because uh, they show indices which compare one country uh, versus another so uh, immediately when this report comes out people download it they go straight to their country and look where they are 
situated in, uh, in the context of uh, neighboring countries, countries within the, the same regional grouping. So, um, and, and ministries of health and other ministries of education are extremely interested in, in a way, this is a, like a thermometer, uh, uh, an indicator of how well they are doing. And uh, we are not supposed to rank countries, but people still do it and they, uh, they, they see the differences and it does spare uh, a lot of uh, public discussion. So one, I think this is sufficient uh, uh, to justify the instrument uh, if it only created this uh, sense of urgency and the importance of comparing uh, oneself to another. But more than that, uh, a second level of action is we have been uh, consulting with member states and have developed a child and adolescent health uh, strategy and the child maltreatment action plan that have recently been approved by the uh, member states. We've also uh, been uh, providing uh, consultations and working on specific risk factor uh, action plans, a roadmap on tobacco, an action plan on alcohol. So we have been producing uh, in consultation with member states and collecting the evidence in order to try and give prioritized actions um, to, to countries. This then leads to specific technical support. Um, and there, our support ranges over uh, a, wide, uh, a wide range of uh, interventions. We've been doing uh, surveys and, uh, and holding policy dialogues on child abuse and, and adverse childhood experiences. We develop uh, surveys, uh, we develop instruments with countries, regulatory instruments that help them to control tobacco and alcohol. Um, and we have done, uh, for example, uh, many uh, supports to countries to help in the passage of effective laws um, to bring smoke-free public places, uh, reduce, uh, uh, reduce smoking via uh, taxation. Um, taxation for both tobacco and alcohol, I am sure, have contributed significantly to the downward trend that we have seen in both these behaviors in this survey, because uh, one of the most effective ways of attacking uh, these two risk factors in adolescence is by uh, putting it out of reach of the small income that they are likely, or the small disposable income that they are likely to have. Um, beyond that, one needs to move outside what the health sector does and to go straight to working with other, uh, with other uh, sectors. So for example, in the work on bullying, um, this is completely out of the reach of the health sector and uh, work has to be done in supporting the uh, education ministry to provide the right uh, sort of interventions. So if you look at the range um, uh, of, of bullying, uh, both being bullied and of bullying others, um, there's quite a, a wide range with an average of about 10%, about one in 10 uh, children have suffered or, or bullying or been or, or bullied others. It changes between countries, it changes uh, be between the behavior of receiving or giving. Uh, uh, I won't go into the details, but it's a sizable problem. And it is quite clear that countries which are able to be at the lower end are those that proactively have programs as early as kindergarten and primary school um, to make the children aware, to put them in, in circumstances where they can receive counseling, where the teachers are enabled to discuss it in a class without threatening the individuals involved um, by bringing in the parents. Such proactive approaches are very well correlated um, with, the type, with, the, with the lower end of the scale. Um, so by providing support and encouraging uh, member states uh, through their education department to produce health promoting schools that look at these issues um, are the types of things. So if I were to summarize, raise consciousness and awareness through the surveys, um, develop mandates and synthesize the evidence uh, for 
countries to be able to make their own action plans and then provide technical support both to the health sector as well as to other sectors such as education and social welfare. I know WHO has got an obesity and children task force um, and the Millennium Development Goals, you know, they set really specific targets for some of these things that, that WHO was going to try and help countries reach. Um, are you setting up anything like that for, for child health behaviours? Yes, we basically are subject to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we, uh, we are very happy to see that in the new uh, Sustainable Development Goals adopted in uh, September, that there have been a range of new uh, targets that are directly related to the, uh, the types of things that we are studying in uh, th this instrument. We're looking at, uh, there's a target on reducing premature mortality uh, by, the, by 2030, by 30% on a basis year of 2010. Um, there are targets on tobacco, substance use, alcohol, um, on uh, deaths on in road traffic uh, injuries and so on. Um, over and above the, the older Millennium Development Goal which uh, looked at maternal and child survival and so on. So now we have a, a stronger mandate to be achieving some of these targets. When I lecture about the subject, I like to tell people that the, that the population that in 2030 is going to the contribute to the smoking statistic of Europe um, as adults who are using tobacco on a daily basis, are today adolescents in this survey telling us um, that they are starting to smoke or not. Um, and that uh, the, the targets that we have for 2030, um, if you look at the young adult bracket then, this is exactly the group that we are talking about now. In our child and adolescent health strategy, for example, we talk about a tobacco-free millennial generation. We are we're making progress there, as you can see, um, because of the numbers go uh, declining uh, in this age group. Uh, but the millennial generation uh, that we hope will be tobacco-free by 2030 is 15 years old now, and and therefore our work is cut out for us to uh, to try and put those uh, to put in the interventions now that we'll, we will be reaping and reporting on in, uh, in 2030. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Gordon Gallia, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon.